Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today is the day we finally get to show you what AMD's new flagship RDNA 3 GPU has to offer, the long-anticipated Radeon RX 7900 XTX. This has to be one of the most hyped product releases of the year, which could be a bad thing as products rarely live up to the hype, so I guess we'll see. A month ago, AMD touted 50 to 70% performance gains for the 79 XTX over the 6950 XT, and that would place it within striking distance of the much more expensive RTX 4090 for rasterization performance, and we saw many online commentators create mock-up graphs showing exactly that. So the internet went into a fizz, salivating the promise of RTX 4090 light performance for $1,000 US, and sure, we all knew it would only be for rasterization performance, but that's what most of you really care about anyway, so it was still very exciting. Tim, though, was quick to note that if AMD was really offering performance that was close to the RTX 4090, that the price would be much higher, as AMD is not your friend, leaving him to conclude that ray tracing performance must be really weak, or AMD were overselling the 7900 XTX's capabilities. Of course, today we finally get to find out, but before we do, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Hetzner. Hetzner is a leading hosting provider and data center operator in Europe with hundreds of thousands of servers in operation. By combining its strengths in innovative technology, attractive prices, expert support, and flexible customer service, Hetzner expanded its market both within and outside Europe. They operate their very own high-tech data centers in Germany and Finland. Hetzner also offers high-performance cloud servers for an amazing price. And not only this, Hetzner is now already covering both the east and west coast of the United States with their latest location in Hillsborough, Oregon. Now, you can deploy cloud servers in five different locations and benefit from features like load balancers, block storage, and more. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so I'm not going to dive into all of the specs. I assume that most of you have already watched our RDNA 3 news video, which covered all that information. And if you didn't, feel free to check it out. But look, in summary, the 7900 XTX is coming in at an MSRP of $1,000 US, while the very similarly named 7900 XT, that'll cost $900. The XTX version packs 6,144 cores, while the XT model has been cut down by 13% to 5,376 cores. Boost clocks for the XTX are rated at 2.5 GHz, while the XT has been dropped by 4% to 2.4 GHz. And then we see that the Infinity Cache has been dropped from 96 MB to 80 MB, so there's a 17% reduction there, dropping the bandwidth from 3.5 GB per second to 2.9 GB per second. Now, both models do utilize 20 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory, but while the XTX receives a 384-bit wide memory bus for a bandwidth of 960 gigabytes per second, the XT has been cut down to a 320-bit wide memory bus, resulting in 800 gigabytes per second, so another 17% reduction there. So at just a 10% discount, the 700 XT doesn't appear as though it's going to be particularly great value based on the paper spec, and we'll look at that part in tomorrow's video. For now, we want to focus on the XTX version. Other noteworthy features of the 7900 XTX is the 355 watt total board power rating, which is higher than that of the RTX 4080, but like the 4080, it does utilize the PCIe 4.0x16 interface. Of course, the most interesting aspect of these new RDNA 3 GPUs is its use of chiplet technology. Rather than going all out with a massive monolithic die, RDNA 3 uses a combination of smaller dies in a similar strategy to that of AMD's latest Ryzen CPUs. This means that to get those top-end GPU configurations, AMD no longer needs to make a single 520mm squared die or greater, like they did with RDNA 2, or approach the behemoth that is AD102, a 600mm squared die that is used by the RTX 4090. AMD's RDNA 3 chiplet approach includes two components, the graphics chiplet die or GCD, which houses the main WGPs and processing hardware, plus multiple memory chiplet dies or MCDs, which include the Infinity Cache and memory controllers. On the flagship 79 XTX, we get one GCD plus six MCDs, while the 7900 XT features a cut down GCD plus five MCDs. AMD's architecture benefits in multiple ways from this move to chiplet technology. One is that they can now split their GPU design over multiple nodes, reducing the amount of expensive leading-edge silicon they need for every single product. The GCD is built on TSMC's latest 5N node, but the MCDs are built on TSMC N6, which is a derivative of their older and less costly 7 nanometer process. This ends AMD's reliance on needing huge chunks of the latest silicon for every high-end GPU. 
The other main advantage is yields. Put simply, large monolithic dies have lower yields than smaller dies. So whenever a design can be split into multiple smaller dies, there's a good chance the yields will increase substantially. AMD has found great success using this approach on their Ryzen CPUs, where modern Zen 4 chiplets are about 70mm squared, so tiny enough that yields would be well over 90%. RDNA 3 won't have as much of an advantage as Zen 4, as the GCD is still relatively large compared to a CPU, but at 300mm squared, it's still half that of AD102, and just 60% as large as Navi 21. So that sort of size saving will have big implications for yields. Flanking the GCD are six MCDs, about 37mm squared in size. So these are tiny chiplets and are just half the size of a Zen 3 CPU core chiplet. Each has a 64-bit GDDR6 controller and 16 megabytes of cache, and on a miniature node like N6, these should have extremely high yields, so AMD will benefit a lot here even though they need 6 of them for the 7100 XTX. All up, while flagship Navi 31 RDNA 3 GPUs still need over 500 square millimeters of silicon, this chiplet approach split across two nodes should reduce manufacturing costs and increase yields. So, it'll be very interesting to see how this approach plays out, and we're here to do just that. Now, for testing, all GPUs have been tested at the official clock specification, so no factory overclocking, and the CPU used is the Ryzen 7 5800X 3D with 32GB of dual rank dual channel DDR4 3200CL14 memory on the MSI MPG X570S Carbon Max Wi Fi. In total, I've tested 16 games at 1440p and 4K, so let's get into the data. First up we have Watch Dogs Legion, and here the 7900 XT looks mighty impressive, cranking out 172 FPS at 1440p to make it faster than not just the RTX 4090, but also the RTX 4080, beating the latter by a 12% margin. Of course the RTX 4090 is CPU bound here, but it's interesting to see that under CPU bound conditions, the Radeon GPU does have a bit more headroom. Now the CPU bottleneck is removed at the 4K resolution, but even so, the 700 XTX was still 9% faster than the RTX 4080, then, when compared to AMD's previous generation flagship part, the 6950XT, we see a 36% performance uplift for the new 7900XTX. The Callisto Protocol is a new game that we've added to our benchmarks, and it's one where the 7900XTX appears to work quite well, and please note I'm not using the built-in benchmark for this testing. With 166 FPS on average, the new Radeon GPU was 8% faster than the RTX 4080, and 50% faster than the 6950XT, so that's a solid gain at 1440p. Then, at 4K, with the ultra quality preset which does use FSR2, the 7900XTX and RTX 4080 were neck and neck, making the RDNA3 GPU 44% faster than the 6950XT. Now I think AMD is dealing with a driver related issue for RDNA3 and Forza Horizon 5, because performance wasn't that good here. I should clarify that there was no kind of stability issues or bugs seen when testing, but performance was much lower than what you'd expect to see. At 1440p, for example, the 700 XTX was just 6% faster than the 6950 XT, so that kind of sucks. The margin did improve a lot at 4K, but even so here, the 700 XTX was just 16% faster than the 6950 XT, and this is a far cry from the sort of 50% typical result that AMD was suggesting in their announcement. This meant that the new Radeon GPU was 5% slower than the RTX 4080, so a disappointing result all around. Here we see that AMD's new RDNA3 GPU trailed the RTX 4080 at 1440p and Rainbow Six Extraction by a slim margin, making it just 26% faster than the 3090 Ti and 36% faster than the 6950 XT. Again, although those are some decent margins, it's a lot less than what AMD initially suggested or indicated. Then at 4K, the 700 XTX falls behind the RTX 4080 by a 9% margin and is now a mere 15% faster than the 3090 Ti, though it was at least 47% faster than the 6950XT. Far Cry 6 is largely GPU bound at 1440p, so the 700XTX is able to roughly match the RTX 4090, despite being just 7% faster than the 6950XT. Moving to 4K though does alleviate the CPU bottleneck, and now the 700XTX is 17% faster than the RTX 4080, and 25% faster than the 6950XT. And although that is a reasonable margin, I expect that most will be disappointed with what we're seeing here relative to the 6950XT, despite it being quite an impressive margin over the RTX 4080. The new RDNA3 GPU looks quite good in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, outpacing the RTX 4080 by an 11% margin at 1440p, though this is a title where Radeon GPUs traditionally do very well, 
and if we turn our attention to the 6950XT comparison, the result is a lot less exciting as here the 7900XTX is just 24% faster. Interestingly, at the 4K resolution, the 700XTX performs better relative to the GeForce GPUs than what we saw at 1440p, as here it matched the RTX 4090, making it 16% faster than the 4080, and this time 33% faster than the 6950XT, which is a decent margin, but also a lot less than the 50-70% to margin AMD suggested during the RDNA 3 announcement. Moving on to Hunt Showdown, where the 7900 XTX and RTX 4080 are neck and neck, delivering just over 250 FPS. That made AMD's flagship just 25% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti, and 32% faster than the 6950 XT. The 4K data is much the same, as in the 700 XT and RTX 4080 are on par, though this time that meant the 700 XTX was just 14% faster than the 3090 Ti, and 30% faster than the 6950 XT. The Outer Worlds uses the Unreal Engine 4, and this game engine typically favours GeForce GPUs, and that's certainly the case with this title. Still, although the 700XTX was 10% slower than the RTX 4080 when comparing the average frame rate, the 1% lows were higher for the Radeon GPU, and we do see a bit of that in our testing. All of that said though, at the 4K resolution, the 1% lows are more in line with the average frame rates, and here the 700XTX was 9% slower than the RTX 4080 and just 26% faster than the 6950XT. Now, as we've seen in our recent Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 benchmarks, this game loves Radeon GPUs, and this is certainly very true when looking at the 7900XTX, where it pumped out an incredible 311 FPS on average at 1440p, and that made it a massive 42% faster than the RTX 4080 and 28% faster than the 4090. These results are certainly outliers in our testing, but Modern Warfare 2 and Warzone 2 are very popular games, so this is great news for AMD. The 7900 XTX even managed to edge out the RTX 4090 at 4K with 193 FPS, making it 5% faster and then 35% faster than the 4080. Moreover, a 43% improvement over the 6950 XT is very impressive, Though, again, given AMD's announcement, you were probably expecting this sort of margin to be more of the norm, if not a worst case scenario for the new RDNA 3 flagship. The Hitman 3 results are heavily CPU limited at 1440p with these next gen GPUs, so the 700 XTX was able to match the 4080 and 4090. Bumping up the resolution of 4K showed some great results for the new RDNA 3 GPU, as it was 15% faster than the RTX 4080 and just 10% slower than the RTX 4090. Again, I suspect these are the sort of margins that gamers anticipating the arrival of the 700 XTX were expecting to be more of the norm. Generally, Radeon GPUs do perform really well in Horizon Zero Dawn, but I've got to say the 700 XTX was quite underwhelming here, trailing the RTX 4080 by a 5% margin at 1440p to come in just 14% faster than the 6950 XT. Yikes. The 4K results were a lot better, but even so, we're looking at RTX 4080 Lite performance, meaning the 7900 XTX was just 26% faster than the 6950 XT and 16% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti. Now, F122 by default does enable ray tracing with the ultra high preset, at least for hardware that supports it, so this is why the 7900 XTX is slower than expected. AMD is still well behind when it comes to RT performance, and we'll look more at that shortly. For now though, we can see that when playing F122 using the highest quality preset, that the 7900XTX is 11% slower than the RTX 4080, and a mere 5% faster than the 3090Ti. That said, in this example, it is 55% faster than the 6950XT, suggesting that RDNA 3's RT support has improved from RDNA 2. Then at the 4K resolution, the 7900XTX drops down to the 3090Ti with 56 FPS on average, making it 13% slower than the RTX 4080, and 36% slower than the 4090. So it is a bit of a wipeout here for AMD. That said, thanks to the use of RT, it was a massive 65% faster than the 6950 XT, so there's at least that. The Cyberpunk 2077 performance at 1440p looks quite good for the 700 XTX, as here it was 5% faster than the RTX 4080, delivering 135 FPS on average. That said, when compared to previous generation products, it was just 24% faster than the 6950XT and 26% faster than the 3090Ti. The 7900XTX does remain strong at the 4K resolution and in fact was able to extend its margin over the RTX 4080 out to 9% with 70 FPS on average. 
That made it 27% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti and 43% faster than the 6950 XT, which is a decent result. I've got to say the Dying Light 2 results are a bit underwhelming though. At 1440p, the 7100 XTX was only able to match the average frame rate of the RTX 4080 with much lower 1% lows. It was also just 17% faster than the 6950 XT, which is no doubt very disappointing for those of you with a previous generation flagship hoping to upgrade. All of that said though, the 4K data was a bit more favourable as here the 7100 XTX was 5% faster than the RTX 4080 and the 1% lows were a lot better. The result though relative to AMD's own 6950 XT was again very disappointing as the new GPU was just 17% faster. Halo Infinite is a game AMD skipped over for their review guide, opting not to show performance, and that's likely because the 700 XTX is very weak here. AMD says they are looking into it though, so it's possible a future driver corrects performance, but for now this is what it looks like. So, this once pro AMD title sees the 7900 XTX trailing the RTX 4080 by a rather large 16% margin, making it just 21% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti and 26% faster than the 6950 XT. So, very disappointing compared to previous generation flagship parts. The 7900 XTX shapes up a little bit better at the 4K resolution, as here it was 6% slower than the RTX 4080, and a more impressive 24% faster than the 3090 Ti, and 35% faster than the 6950 XT. Last up we have Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and I was quite surprised to find the 700 XTX trailing the 4080 by a 13% margin. Worse still, this meant it was just 18% faster than the 6950 XT. The margins did improve a little at 4K, here it was 6% slower than the 4080 and 25% faster than the 6950 XT, so better but still quite poor overall. Alrighty, so now it is time for the 16 game average data and we'll start at 1440p. Here we see that on average the 700 XTX and RTX 4080 were neck and neck with around 180 FPS on average. That means the 7900 XTX is 17% slower than the RTX 4090, which given the price is obviously quite a good result, though it's also only 25% faster than the 3090 Ti and 6950 XT. It was also just 35% faster than the RTX 3090 and 6900 XT, so for those of you with previous generation flagship parts it might not be worth the upgrade. Now looking at the 4K data, the 700 XTX was 20% slower than the RTX 4090, but 4% faster than the RTX 4080, so again we're looking at 4080 light performance. And that made the 700 XTX 26% faster than the RTX 3090 Ti, and 35% faster than the 6950 XT. So not nearly as good as the 50% or greater many of you are hoping for, that said it was 49% faster than AMD 6900 XT. Now although we didn't go over the 1080p data, as it is largely CPU limited, I've got the averages for you so let's just take a quick look at that. Again the 700 XTX and RTX 4080 are basically on par, but this time the Radeon GPU is just 6% slower than the 4090, again because of the CPU bottleneck. We also see that the 7900 XTX was just 21% faster than the 6950 XT. Now let's take a look at ray tracing performance, with and without upscaling. If you recall, the 700 XTX was 13% slower than the RTX 4080 in our previous F122 testing, as the game enables RTFX by default when using the ultra high preset. Here with the ultra high preset but with the RTFX disabled, the 700 XTX pumped out 216 FPS, making it 13% faster than the RTX 4080 and 51% faster than the 6950 XT. Now with RT plus upscaling enabled, so just FSR 1.0 for the Radeon GPUs, the 700 XTX was still 10% faster than the RTX 4080 using DLSS, but this is hardly an apples to apples comparison. Now at the native 4K, the 700 XTX was seen previously to be 13% slower than the 4080, but a massive 65% faster than the 6950 XT. So there are good gains to be had over previous generation RDNA 2 GPUs when using ray tracing. Next up we have Watch Dogs Legion and this one doesn't support FSR so upscaling is really only available for the GeForce GPUs. In short, using the very high preset with RT disabled, the 700 XTX was 9% faster than the RTX 4080 and 36% faster than the 6950 XT. Then with RT set to ultra but no upscaling, the 700 XTX was 19% slower than the RTX 4080 with just 44 FPS on average, but it was also 52% faster than the 6950 XT. So some decent gains there for RDNA 3 over RDNA 2, but it also meant that the 700 XTX was only up to speed with last generation's 3090 Ti when it comes to RT performance. 
Moving on to Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy, we see that the 7900 XTX and RTX 4080 are neck and neck with 140 FPS, making them 27% faster than the 6950 XT. With ray tracing enabled, but no upscaling, the new RDNA 3 GPU rendered 53 FPS on average, which is basically the same performance received by the 6950 XT, and 27% slower than the RTX 4080. So I have to assume this is some kind of driver issue. Next up we have Dying Light 2, and please note the performance shown previously in Dying Light 2 was done so using the high preset, and this uses DirectX 11. The ray tracing preset forces DirectX 12, and this seems to break the 7900 XTX. For example, using the high preset, it was 5% faster than the RTX 4080, but here without RT enabled, so disabling the RTFX that would have otherwise been enabled using this preset, the 7900 XTX was 25% slower than the RTX 4080. Now, with those RTFX enabled, so the standard untouched ray tracing quality preset, the 700 XTX managed just 27 FPS on average, the same performance delivered by the 3090 Ti, and 50% stronger performance than that of the 6950 XT, but it was also 31% slower than the RTX 4080. So, good gains relative to previous gen AMD hardware, but not good when compared to Ada Lovelace. The last game we're going to look at ray tracing performance with is Cyberpunk 2077, and here the 700 XTX couldn't even match the 3090 Ti, trailing it by a 20% margin with just 20 FPS on average, and that meant that it was 35% slower than the RTX 4080, but it was at least 54% faster than the 6950 XT. With upscaling enabled, so FSR 2.1 quality for the Radeon GPUs, the 700 XTX was able to deliver 39 FPS, making it 44% faster than the 6950 XT, but it was still 15% slower than the 3090 Ti, which was of course using DLSS, and then 33% slower than the RTX 4080. Now it's time for a look at total system power consumption, and here the 700 XTX pushed total usage to 468 watts in Dying Light 2, so in terms of power usage it is comparable to the RTX 3080 and 3090. And that means system usage was 9% lower than that of the 6950 XT, but 16% greater than the RTX 4080, making the 4080 the more efficient GPU. We also see that power consumption between the 4080 and 700 XTX was more comparable in Doom Eternal. Here the Radeon GPU pushed total system usage just 4% higher, though it was also only just 4% lower than that of the 6950 XT. Then we have Hitman 3, and again the 4080 and 700 XTX were very similar, basically comparable with other previous generation high-end GPUs, excluding the 3090 Ti of course, which was quite the power pig. And here we see when locking the frame rate to 90 FPS in Cyberpunk 2077, that the 700 XTX pushed total system power usage 24% higher than that of the RTX 4080, again confirming that RDNA 3 isn't nearly as power efficient as Nvidia's Ada Lovelace architecture. Okay, so time for the all-important cost per frame analysis, and we'll start with the MSRPs using the 4K data. So, if all current and previous generation GPUs were to be sold at the MSRP, the 700 XTX would actually be the best value deal on the market, undercutting the RX 6800 XT by a 5% margin, and the 6950 XT by a massive 32%. More importantly though, it's almost a 20% improvement in terms of cost per frame when compared to the RTX 4080. Now here's a look at GPU pricing using the current Newegg data, which will be about a week old by the time you see this video. The RTX 4080 is currently selling for at least $1,270 US, so $70 US above MSRP, and for this comparison we have to assume that the 700 XTX will be available for the advertised $1,000 US, but of course that is by no means guaranteed. But let's just say that it is. That'll be a 24% discount in terms of cost per frame when compared to the RTX 4080. And as we just saw, with both at the MSRP, the Radeon GPU will be at least 20% better value. In today's market, it is also slightly better value than the 6900 XT and 6950 XT, so there is that. While the only products to offer a better price to performance ratio include the RX 6800 and 6800 XT, both of which are significantly slower. So when it comes to rasterization performance, though F122 was tested with RT, but when it comes to largely rasterization performance, the 7900 XTX is quite good in terms of value, at least relative to the terrible value RTX 4080. Hmm. Before wrapping up the testing, here's a quick look at thermal and clock behavior of the AMD reference model. Installed in an ATX case in a 21 degree room, the AMD Radeon RX 7900 XTX peaked at a hotspot temperature of 80 degrees, 
after an hour of gameplay, with a peak average died temperature of 67 degrees, and this was achieved with a fan speed of 1900 RPM. We also saw a typical operating clock frequency of 2275 MHz, and the memory operated at 19.9 gigabits per second, so just shy of the advertised 20 gigabits per second. Overall, the reference card ran cool and relatively quiet, so I expect all partner models to work very well, and that's something we will look at in the near future. All right, so at the start of this video, I touched on how hyped the Radeon RX 7900 XTX has been, AMD themselves are largely to blame for this, but just to make sure that I wasn't off base, I polled our audience asking what their expectations were based on AMD's RDNA 3 announcement, where they compared the 7900 XTX to the 6950 XT, showing gains of between 50 to 70%. The majority of you expected the 7900 XTX to be on average at least 50% faster than the 6950 XT, based on what you'd seen so far from AMD. With 60% of all the people who voted, voting 50% or more, it's clear AMD messed up and set expectations way too high. At 50% faster than the 6950 XT, the 700 XTX would be at least 10-15% to faster than the RTX 4080, and really not a great deal slower than the 4090. In reality though, the 700 XTX was on average just 35% faster than the 6950 XT, placing it on par with the RTX 4080. Now look, I could give AMD 40% faster, let's go with that, that's probably achievable, an extra 5% over what I showed. Margin of error, rounding differences, uh, they used a faster CPU, so that could also help broaden the gap a bit there. But 40% is really as high as I could go in our 16 game average, it's certainly not going to be higher than that when accounting for those other variables. And AMD's own review guide showed the 700 XTX to be on average 43% faster than the 6950 XT. So slightly more favorable than our matchup, though the sample of games was different and the hardware used, again, was different. They used a Zen 4 CPU, for example. The point is, though, I think people were expecting more, and that's going to lead to a lot of negative feedback from gamers. And if that is indeed the case, AMD has no one to blame but themselves. But let's just put hype aside. Is the 700 XTX any good? Minus a few teething issues, which I'll discuss in a moment, I think this is a decent product. Certainly not bad compared to the competition, but also not good either. Although the 700 XTX looks quite good in terms of value for those interested primarily in rasterization performance, at $1,000 US it's not exactly cheap. Sure, it looks pretty good next to the RTX 4080 delivering the same level of performance for $200 US less, but the RTX 4080 sucks at the current asking price, and that's not just me saying that, it's gamers at large, as sales across the globe for RTX 4080 has been extremely weak. And that's a problem because in almost every measurable metric, the RTX 4080 is a superior product to that of the 7900 XTX. The RTX 4080 offers comparable rasterization performance, significantly better ray tracing performance, better upscaling as DLSS is superior to FSR, it also uses less power, and the media engine is better supported. Really, the only thing going for the 700 XTX is the fact that it's 17% cheaper, but I feel like when spending $1,000 US on a graphics card, that's a lot of money, $1,000 US, do you really care about $200 US? Wouldn't you just spend the extra money to get the superior product? If we're talking about lower price tiers, let's say $600 to $700, just $100 difference there, the percentage difference is actually similar, but I feel someone looking at spending $600 might value $100 a lot more than someone spending $1,000 values $200. It's an assumption I know, but $1,000 is a lot of money just depending on a graphics card at that point. Are you really looking to cut corners on things like ray tracing performance, upscaling, and so on? All of that said, I feel AMD needs to be coming in at least 20% cheaper, if not 25% cheaper. So $900 US would be a more appropriate price given what we've seen, which is kind of humorous given that I felt the RTX 4080 really needed to be $900 for it to be an exciting product. And again, given sales, I feel like I was probably right about that one. But that's the kind of discount where I can say for most of you, the benefits of the GeForce GPU simply aren't worth the price premium. For $900 US, you really would just get the 7900 XTX. After all, if you're someone who mostly plays multiplayer games like myself, stuff like ray tracing, it's really not that appealing. You're really after raw FPS performance, and in stuff like Warzone 2, Call of Duty, the 700 XTX just delivers that in spades. 
but at 17% less than the RTX 4080, it's still not really the obvious choice. My time with the 7900 XTX wasn't flawless either, as I ran into a few game crashes, and I spoke with other reviewers who did suffer a few crashes as well. And now this could simply be a pre-release driver issue that AMD will solve for public release, or it could be something that gamers will be plagued with for a few months to come. It's really hard to say at this point in time. I also ran into a frustrating black screen issue, but it's not the black screen issue that 5700 XT owners may be familiar with. This one simply required me to disconnect and then reconnect the display. The game didn't crash. For some reason, it would flicker and then go black. This didn't happen a lot. It didn't happen often. So this may be something that nobody else reports. And again, this could be something that's just to do with the pre-release driver and you won't see this with the public release driver. Again, I don't know. In any case, this was a rare occurrence. It only happened twice in all of my testing. So hopefully, again, this isn't something that end users will experience, but it is worth mentioning given the other stability issues I ran into with the review driver. Also, Jared from Jared's Tech ran into a slow boot issue with his Intel test system where the 700 XTX would take twice as long to load into Windows from startup when compared to something like an RTX 4080 or really any other GPU. MSI also confirmed this issue with Jared, and at this point the cause is unknown, so I suspect MSI would be working with AMD on the solution, and it's unclear if this affects other motherboards, but it was a confirmed issue, so I'm reporting it here. Though I should note that I didn't run into this issue with my MSI AM4 motherboard. Anyway, I don't want to make the Radeon RX 7900 XTX sound like a broken product, as our testing was mostly smooth, but there were a few hiccups along the way that I hope we can blame on the review driver. I guess we'll know soon enough. Overall, the Radeon RX 7900 XTX looks to be a decent product, at least relative to its GeForce competitor, but whether or not it's worth it at $1,000 US will depend on how much stock you place in stuff like ray tracing performance. Also, for those of you with previous generation flagships, the 7900 XTX simply won't be worth the upgrade, and while it is a big step forward from something like an RX 6800, it is also roughly twice the price, so it's not really moving the needle forward when it comes to value, and worse still, the RX 6800 and 7900 XTX really could be members of the same product family. Frankly, neither the 7900 XTX or RTX 4080 would have me racing out to buy one, so... I guess we'll have to wait around and see what the lower tier models have to offer, but I'm certainly not holding my breath, certainly not for anything amazing. And that is really going to do it for this review. If you did appreciate this one, then please do give it a like. It was a lot of work. And you can also subscribe for more content. As I said, we have our 1700 XT review coming, and there'll probably be some partner cards that'll be worth checking out. So we'll do that. Uh, also, we have Floatplane or Patreon. If you want to support the channel and get some really cool perks in return, you get access to our monthly live stream. Tim and I will be doing that. Uh, well, we do that towards the end of the month. We do Q&As, uh, behind the scenes content, and we also have exclusive Discord server for members only. So pretty cool stuff there. So if you're interested, check it out. But if not, perfectly fine. And I would like to thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve. See you again next time.